there are several things that you should never do and one of them is give a presentation after somebody's told you how to give a presentation. <laughs> just, just one to file away. Hello, my name's Jonathan Forbes. I'm the chief architect at Aquila Insight. Uh, Eleni showed you a slide earlier that showed analytics and consultancy and engineering. I sit in the engineering part of the slide, so we're very much the back office, if you like. Um, we lead with our, with our analysts. And after hearing Eleni's talk, you can understand why. My job in engineering is then, once that insight's been proven, how do we productionize it? How do we provide it even though there isn't a, a data scientist in-house? And some of the things I'm going to talk about tonight in terms of, of, of building uh, the perfect data scientist relate to that kind of uh, relationship and how we do things. For those of you who thought I was going to bring a robot, an artificial intelligence, or something to the desk and say, here's the perfect data scientist. Sorry, this is at this stage anyway, we're working on it, but at this stage anyway, is a little bit more prosaic uh, than that. Okay, right. I'm gonna try some audience participation now if you're up for it. If you have your smartphones or tablets or computers and you want to join in, please go to that website, type in that code, or if, you're, if your phone's capable of it, flash that black and white thing, which they call a QR code, and see if it takes you to the right place. And there are a couple of questions. Uh, so as you get to that, I will bring up the results, and it should be real time. And if you end up on Playboy or something, it's not my fault. OK, good, somebody's in. Somebody else is in. <laughs> oh, seriously, seriously, the left hand, the left hand. Where's, where's my Aquila friends? We pressed in the wrong meter. Oh, did you? Yeah. Okay. All right. Yes. We've got a couple. All right. Okay, there's another question, I think, after it. We still going on this? Do you want a wee bit more time? You're good. Come on, the engineers. I know there are more than two data scientists here. I've met them, for goodness sake. Oh, there we go, six. All right, good. All right, then there's a wee follow-up question. This is just about me understanding your expectations of this thing called a data scientist. <laughs> yeah, okay. Good. <laughs> Plenty of scope for tonight's talk then. All right. Yeah. I would pretty much agree with you. Uh, from <coughs> reading from left to right, I'll, I'll strongly agree, strongly agree, very strongly agree, strongly agree. I wish, I wish that was the case. <laughs> Um, where are we? They try. Um, yes, agreed in principles, in principle. <laughs> Good luck. Good luck in my experience finding this, uh, uh, this piece on the right hand side. These, these are very much, and I think that's half the point of, of what I want to, to talk about tonight. Okay, good. Um, we're largely in the same place, I think. Let's get Colombo back up. All right, thank you for that. That gives me some ammunition to work with the rest of this talk. Because it, I, I do actually agree with you to a large extent about that right-hand side. I was laughing um, because I'm not seeing enough of it. Um, I was looking earlier on uh, through the syllabus for the, the data science boot camp, and I'm seeing lots of good things in here. We'll see them later on, and, and, and in part, some of, the some of the stuff that sits on the right-hand side of that chart, which I would call data engineering or even just engineering, um, is where I want to take a lot of my data scientist colleagues. So I was quite arrogant when I sat down and wrote this talk. This was me lecturing to data scientists about what data scientists should be. I'm not a data scientist. I spend my life with technology. 
Um, when I got to the end of this talk, I had pretty much reversed my view to some extent, so maybe you'll see why, uh, and I'll take you through it. This is a, a very interesting chap, Kirk Bourne, uh, works for Booz Allen Hamilton, a big uh, consultancy, global consultancy. He's, he's, he's got good things to say, actually. Um, lots of them. Uh, if you join his Twitter stream, you'll get stuff every couple of hours. Um, but he calls it the, te uh, the seven C's, which I think there are actually 10 of them up there. Um, not, not a good start for uh, data science, but there we go. Um, must model accurately. Um, cognitive curious. Curious, the scientific curiosity has to be there. So Eleni's point about getting into the raw data, that's what she wants to see. She doesn't want to see the necessarily the cleaned up uh, stuff when she first looks. Creativity, I think we'd all agree there. Uh, and all the way through, cool under pressure, tolerance for ambiguity, etc. This is, this is actually a really good generic description of the kind of overall qualities that you want in your, in your data scientist. Um, coming down the bottom, computational is where I'm going to spend some of, some of this talk. Now, how many of you know who Drew Conway is? You know who Drew is? Yeah, if you don't know who Drew actually is, you've probably seen a Venn diagram that he's responsible for, the data scientist Venn diagram. Um, there, there's a slightly updated version of that, not by, not by Drew, but by Stephen Colassa, who works for SAP. It looks like this. So you can see there's Drew Conway's hacking, substantive experience. Uh, um, oh, I can't remember his third one now, but. And you can see all these, he, uh, Stephen's added communication to it. Stephen's done it in a slightly tongue-in-cheek way. I quite like this. I've labeled this to guarantee maximum flaming. And by God, I think he's right. Um, here's your perfect data scientist, an expert communicator, an expert statistician, an expert programmer, an expert, an expert business person. You know anybody like that? Um, and there's all the different variations. So apparently, perfect data scientists, probably as good a programmer as the core R development team. That's, that's a big ask. So it, that such an individual must spend all their time on online courses and Coursera and all the rest of it, learning, learning all this stuff that they're supposed to be experts at, and, and good luck trying to recruit them, certainly out of Silicon Valley. So I think this is quite hard. Uh, to do. So we're going to see how other people do it um, because I think this is the model that, that we should all be following and I'm going to extend it slightly as well. Uh, over on the left hand side, as you will I'm quite sure all recognize, is a very famous person. You're nodding, that's good. There's at least one person who knows. Greg will know who that is. That's Peter Higgs. Uh, Professor Peter Higgs who discovered the Higgs boson, won the Nobel Prize. Guy on the right. I'll, I'll, seriously, I'll give you money if you, if, if you know who that is. <laughs> guy on the right guy on the right's a guy called Frederick Bourdre. He's the head or the director of accelerators at, at CERN. Without him doing his job, no Nobel Prize over here. So the scientist and the engineer, these guys you must know, and you don't read the notes either. You must know, look, I've given you a big clue. <laughs> you know who that is? Yes, spot on. Mm. A very rich Melissa Myers, she sold her business or she sold Yahoo uh, uh, over the weekend for many billions. Google's first female engineer, 20th employee, very talented. Now, I'm taking a bit of a liberty here because Melissa Myers, I think, is a computer scientist but spent her time in the technology side. Larry Page spent his time in the algorithmic side of the business. So there we go, that's how we do it in Google. And this is God. For those of you of a certain age will understand that reference. And this is Lee Dixon, who's God's guitar tech. He doesn't get to play that thing and make his music without him actually doing all the hard work, making sure it happens and making sure this thing works. So everybody else operates that way. Why do we look for wrapping all these skills into a data scientist? Some people call them the purple unicorns, the rainbow colored unicorns, whatever. Let's, let's not look at those characters. We can't, we're not gonna get them. I'm gonna make a slight plea in a minute. Uh, uh, you'll hear where we are. What we do is we 
try as best as possible to pair up data engineers into, or if not pair them up, then, then put them in with teams with data scientists. Um, I was chatting to Rona McLennan earlier on about the good old days when she and I used to work up in BP and oil and gas in Aberdeen. And, and the smartest person in, in our business, in fact, several of the businesses as Rona and I were talking about, was the DBA. When you were hacking around trying to get insight into data, you invariably could do it 10 times faster if you just got to spend 15 minutes at the feet of the DBA because he could make your life or she could make your life that much more efficient and optimized. Um, we've moved away from that model for some reason, um, a little bit. Certainly we don't have DBAs working that closely in our experience, working that closely with analysts and, and data analysts in business. Um, they are, if they exist, they're firmly part of a, an IT organization and you're not gonna get access to them when you're a, an analyst, particularly a consulting analyst. So we try and shortcut it a little bit by sending in data engineers and we find it gets worse, this problem the more you move away from the, for, from the relational environment and you move into distributed computing and Spark and Hadoop and so on. The number of parameters that you can tweak on a Hadoop cluster or a Spark cluster to make your life that much better uh, runs to hundreds. I don't think it's fair that we expect Eleni and her colleagues to be able to configure a Spark cluster. But I did notice that six of you did thought it was okay for people to write Scala on Spark clusters. Not quite there. Um, so we put them together, particularly where, when we're working on big data platforms. Uh, and we find that a very efficient way of working, a very uh, 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 useful way of working, and it, it helps the productivity of all concerned. Um, we don't like this. We think this is a terrible idea for those of you who are actually in organizations that make very hard splits between IT and business probably agree, I would expect. Now, I know, basically, I know I'm preaching to the converted to a large extent. It's a team sport analytics. Um, I am going to make a small request. I did say at the start that I was quite arrogantly going about this presentation when I started it, saying my data scientists need to up their game a bit. I'm not there at that, this point in time. I think there's a little bit of work that we need to do to bring them on, make them, make them more self-sufficient and, and make them better. It's just a little bit. Now, the reason I feel a little bit reticent about talking about it here tonight is because one of the tasks I did was to go away and actually sit down and say, well, what do these data scientists actually do skill-wise? This stuff. Deep down, what are they actually doing? That, that syllabus and more. So this. I came across this one as a, as a decent summary and I've added some stuff to it as, as we went along. It's a couple of years old. So, <laughs> from the left to the right, there's your sort of core academic skills and experiences, stats, econometrics, machine learning. And the problem is it's not kind of one of those. You might major in one or two of them, but a good data scientist knows pretty much the, the lot of them. There's the other stuff that you can fall back on when this stuff isn't giving you what you need. There's, you heard Bellini earlier on, uh, the comment about, well, it was just a logistic regression pulled from the back of her head uh, to say, yeah, it's just that algorithm for that, that, that piece of analysis. There's a pretty short list, of the kind of things that are in their heads. There was a question, in fact, you sir, asked those questions about tools and all the rest of it. There's what, we, there's what we expect the data scientists to be able to use to pretty much, when we send our, when we send Eleni and Audrey and Greg and, and stuff into, into businesses to work on analytics, we don't know what they're gonna find in terms of, of tools, but they have to be able to cope with whatever the, the client uses. Increasingly, as, as was said, we're seeing R, SAS is still a mainstay in, in a lot of businesses. Python's coming through. There's a little bit of that, and, and C++, it's kind of niche sports. SPSS appears quite a lot as well. But we kind of take it for granted that these guys know this stuff. And they know Tableau, and they might know Spotfire uh, as well. And of course, they know VBA and Excel. JavaScript, <coughs> Perl, and PHP, um, dubious, I think. We, we wouldn't necessarily expect that. These ones, yeah. We're, we're increasingly, our analysts increasingly spend their time doing that 
away from the engineer at all, just spinning up Hadoop clusters themselves, running Spark clusters, doing their analysis, closing it down again. And then all the, the usual big data stuff uh, uh, that we see. This is the bit. It's not really come out particularly well. The stuff in blue is, is everything that Eleni knows today. It is, isn't it? You told me on the train. <laughs> everything, all of it, backwards. The stuff in green, there's a little bit of overlap between the, the data engineering side of the business and the data science side of the business. And then this stuff here is the bit that I want my data scientists to get a little bit more experience and a little bit more skill with. So internally in Aquila, we run, we run training sessions where the engineers teach the data scientists about how to make best use of that kind of stuff. Put data engineers into project teams, at least uh, at the beginning of those teams so that they can, we don't want, these are, Eleni didn't mention it, they're very expensive guys, very expensive people, data scientists. So you want them to keep them as productive as possible. So you put in a data engineer to make sure that that happens. Um, my own personal bugbear is I really wish my data scientists knew more about the basics and fundamentals of computers, memory and CPU, and a wee bit of network security and why firewalls are a good thing, not a bad thing, stopping you from doing anal uh, analytics and also the tuning and the analysis piece. We will, in some cases, we have done for some clients, uh, expose the innards of their process, their analytics server architectures in uh, using tools like Observium and Nagios and so on. So they can see, and Audrey's a, got experience of this one as well, they can see that when they run a neural network job in R, it's gonna consume huge amounts of memory. And the server that worked yesterday for a linear regression isn't going to work today for a neural network job. So we also, on the engineering side, because ultimately we're lazy, we, we, we give them an app that manages, allows them to change those statistics, the, the capabilities of their infrastructure to suit their model. If we were really, really, really clever, we're not there yet, we would work it out automatically so that when they started the job, we would spin up the right <coughs> infrastructure. But for now, it's about making the data scientist as self-serving as, as they can be. All right, so that was the slide that made me think it's not really fair what I'm asking my data scientist to do. So that's why this bit here is only halfway across. I don't, I don't want you to know it all. First of all, you'd put me out of a job. But I, but I want you to know a little bit of it, a little bit of that. I want you to know a little bit about how computers work and networks work so that we can have the conversations in the language that we both understand. Um, okay. So, this is how we communicate uh, um, the sort of relative skills. The data scientist on the left-hand side, the data engineer on the right-hand side. And when we talk to people about data science, we're talking about this kind of stuff. That previous slide will indicate that 46.6% is probably higher now. Um, over here, our data engineers spend all their time glued to screens, automating everything they possibly can. They are exceptionally patient individuals. I don't know where we get them from. When they're not doing that, they're taking everything apart and leaving a horrible mess in the desk, and they run everything from the command line. Now, if I could just get a, oh, I don't know, one or two percent of this little lot moved over here a wee bit, perfect data scientist. That will do me. Not all moonlight and roses, I fully accept that. This is one of my favorite relationships between the scientist, who in this case happens to be a racing driver, and the engineer on the right-hand side. This is Kimi Raikkonen, and this is how Kimi Raikkonen treats his race engineer. This is the guy who builds the car to keep him on the road. Yes, 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 I'm doing all the time. You don't have to remind me every second. Snarky, snarky racing driver and this one I quite like a lot. I wish one of my data scientists would say this to me, leave me alone, I know what I'm doing. Um, so yes, it's not moonlight and roses, but for us, we have to, all the fantastic work, the insight that these guys bring out, we have to productionize so that it's still there whenever they've gone. And it's live and it's happening in real time and moving. So yes, there is, a, occasionally we call it a creative tension. Now, this is the, the, we're coming to a close. This is the bit that I'm interested in seeing what happens uh, going forward. 
in this business and, and M MBN obviously uh, uh, sponsoring uh, uh, or arranging tonight's and hosting tonight's event with, with the Data Lab. I'm curious about how this might impact on, on how they work as well. Um, I'm curious because I know this kind of thing happens in other places. So I'm wondering if we're going to see strongly bonded data scientists and data engineers in the same way that Eric Clapton and Eric Clapton's guitar tech have been together for over a quarter of a century and they move between their gigs. Are we going to see similar kind of pairings or, or team-like movements in the market in the same way that big consultancies will steal somebody's pension and remunerations consulting team and, and make it their own? Um, I think we'll see the analytics activities themselves speed up because you get into a rhythm and you start to build patterns and reusable stuff and the engineer knows what the scientist needs and works and what their favorite tool is, how it needs to be set up and how it needs to be deployed. Um, and that's what, that's, <laughs> that's what I'm, I'm also curious about. I think the tooling, your question earlier, and this goes against all certainly large company IT governance. I think we'll get data scientists going, no, I'm not going to use, I'm just going to choose SAS for the time being. <laughs> Other analysis tools are likely in the, no, I'll give you another example. I'm not going to use, uh, we're not going to use Python, which is the corporate standard in here. Why? Because that person who costs a fortune and has all these skills practices their magic using R or SAS or something else. So I can see, and this is a good thing, I can see the analytics field starting to get more and more influence about how that work is done and that what used to potentially be an IT call in the past isn't necessarily an IT call going forward, which I think is healthy. You don't give Eric Clapton a drum kit and expect him to make, make music. You give him his guitar. All right, I think that's us. No, it isn't. There's one. One last one. Here's my provocative statement. If you and the roles that you are in are not getting the support as data scientists, are not getting the support from your engineering team that enables you to do the job that you need to do it and the way you need to do it, if you're not seeing that investment, either it's up to you to change it and you can do that using some of the, the techniques that Eleni showed you today, bring out the power of the insight and the analytics, or leave, go somewhere that does, go somewhere that appreciates the skill and the art and the craft. That's me, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Jonathan. You're very Beth. welcome. Thank you very much, that was very, very interesting indeed. So we're going to open it up for questions before we wrap up to partake in some more refreshments and the bit networking. So, any questions? How do we get young people to be interested in becoming an engineer or a scientist? I want them to be both, as you yeah. kind of got. I'll have you, and we do this internally. We use those kind of skills or, or these kind of syllabus to. Uh, to bring engineers through and give them a better appreciation of what an analyst is actually going through. Um, we sponsor people to do, or, or we pay for people to do online courses on big data analytics and that kind of thing. So they get the direct experience themselves of solving problems under pressure and on time scales, and they get a feel for it. But I don't know if you noticed the thing about the way Eleni was speaking about communicating. I, um, Hence my first, my first comment when I, stood, when I stood up. It's an art as well as a science. If John Brodie was here tonight, he'd be sitting at the back going, amen, I knew you'd finally understand. It is an art as much as a science. Um, and, and if that doesn't bring the creativity out of people, I don't know. And we have the same thing on the engineering side. We have some real creative talent on our engineering side. It's a creative field, so I don't know. The one thing that usually works is to say, look how much money you can make. Mm. Any other questions? I read that observation on that. You said the engineers were expensive. Sorry? You said the engineers No, I said the data scientists were, were expensive. Oh, okay. Engineers one are one almost one as expensive these days. <laughs> Sorry? All the front men were the expensive ones, so I'm not going to wrong end of that. They, they, I, in a business like Aquila, a the engineering team isn't the, the, the guys sitting in the engineering team aren't the revenue stream. Now we make things in there that are part of a 
colours, revenue stream, products, and, and all the rest of it, analytical platform, data management stuff. But in a colours business, that's why we put these guys front and centre. They're the Peter Higgs, they're the Eric Clapton, they're, they're the, the big act, and we're just there to make life that much easier for them. Um, so we are commensurately uh, uh, less well paid, I think, level for level. I don't think it's a bad thing. Certainly agree. We, we we we're running an intern program at the minute this summer, precisely to to bring out to, to give a, a small number of people the experience of it. It's not neat and tidy. It's kind of messy and mucky, and it uses the wrong format. And by the way, it's your job to fix it. Um, so we try and bring out that experience there. Um, my fear would be coming back to your your point, is Jim, isn't it? My fear is coming back to, to Jim's point is is the risk of putting people off. And start work where they don't necessarily have the skill or maturity to understand how to deal with it. But I, I, I would love, actual, I'd love courses to, to use actual messy data, you know, with missing values and nulls and stuff that's been shifted over three columns that you have to piece back together again, so that they learn, if nothing else, how to handle it in their analyses. There's more tools and techniques than. <laughs> yeah, I was looking at that thing. Uh, that I, I think if, if you were to ask uh, Greg, who's sitting behind you, who, who does this for a living like a lady, he, Greg, it would be fair to say that you kind of need all those techniques because you don't know what you're going to get in terms of solving a problem when you go in. Well, the techniques, it's really about the techniques because they perform better in different problems. I don't know about the tools, though. <laughs> and yes, the tools have, each of them have some advantages and other have some disadvantages. I'm kind of, I'm kind of with, with Greg. There's, we could probably, there's probably maybe four tools that, that the guys will, will see on site. And then there's some more niche ones, depending on, on the business that they're going in. Um, but when we look to hire people, we're not put off by somebody who knows MATLAB but doesn't know R, because it's just a tool that allows you to get to the end game. And we know MATLAB gets used a lot in universities and, uh, and so on, and therefore it's not a defining quantity, it's just a technique. But that, that, that plethora of tools, that where we are at the minute is we're, we're, we're a couple of decades further on from the day when a single relational database solves your problem. Depending on the data types that you get, the speed at which it arrives, all the 3D stuff, each one of those is, is the solution for that thing. And I, I did have a slide, I took it out, I probably should have left it in, that showed you the ecosystem of all the tools in the sort of data science world, uh, done by Mango, Mango Solutions. If you can find it on the internet, it's very, very good. It's a mess, but they're all niche. They're all there to do a specific job, and increasingly in engineering and architecture terms, they're all needed in some shape or form. You were going to ask a question. So, the first thing, you know, maybe it's a wide range of technology, because you're going to be talking to Yeah, I take the point. We throw people in to clients and they, and they have to deal with whatever they find there. So, so yes, it is a, a skill. I, if I go back to that seven C's that turned out to be 10 C's slide, and, uh, uh, and one, of the, one of the skills there, one of the C's, bit of a hatchet job, it was continuous professional development or continuous ongoing learning. And that's what I think it, it boils down to. And I think at the end of the day, many of the tools and techniques are actually, once you've learned one, it's not as big a hurdle to learn. It's like language, it's not, it's a, not as big a hurdle for the next one. So I was glad to see that kind of mix on the, on the syllabus. That's helpful. If I, if I was to ask for one thing is 
the basic computery stuff, right? Just between you and me. There's an assumption that that's a that's a yeah. given already. Yeah. Okay. Can I come in and test them? <laughs> Thank you.